Hello, thank you for tuning in to this episode of Experiences, New Mexico. The founding of the city of Alamogordo happened in 1898. Although most of the history is well known, there are a couple of facts that you may not be as familiar with. Hello, I'm Dave Townsend, volunteer, docent at the Tularosa Basin Museum of History. It's my great pleasure today to talk to you just briefly about the founders of the town of Alamogordo. The three men who are most involved in that story are shown in replica form on the wall behind me. John Arthur Eddy, Charles Bishop Eddy, William Ashton Hawkins. The Eddy brothers were from New York. They had done a lot in the Southwest as far as development of railroads and irrigation systems and that sort of thing. They had been involved on the east side of New Mexico at uh, Pecos with several projects there. And they had been involved with projects in Colorado, around Salida, Colorado. When they came to this area, they had in mind the development of what would be a real modern company town. They wanted something different in Alamo Ordo, and I think they achieved something very different here. They were developing the El Paso Northeastern Railroad. In other words, Alamo Ordo was to be a location on what was to become an inter intercontinental railway system. But there was a uniqueness about what they did try to develop because these individuals, particularly the Eddy brothers, did not like alcohol or the idea of alcohol being in their town. They had developed the town of Eddy, which is now the town of Carlsbad. There they had tried to develop a town with complete and total prohibition. It hadn't worked or had worked shoddily here in Alamogordo in this area. First house lot sold in this area on June 7th, 1898. They operated through a holding company called the Alamogordo Improvement Company. So purchases of lots, both commercial and residential, were made through the Alamogordo Improvement Company. And in those deeds of sale, the Alamogordo Improvement Company put what it, in legal terms is called a negative easement. This negative easement told you what you could not do. You could not sell, manufacture, distribute, have anything to do with alcohol on your lot. The only exceptions to that negative easement were lots one, two, three, four of block 50. This was block 50. I say this, the area on which we're sitting now. On lots one, two, three, and four, alcohol could be so manufactured, distributed, right in the center of this town they were building. Why do it that way? Well, the story is that they wanted for sure to know who was consuming alcohol. That negative easement, that Block 50 ordinance, is going to be tested so many times in the courts, all the way down to 1980. It'll be tested and it held through that period. The social development of Alamogordo was governed as much by that Block 50 ordinance as anything else. So you had a good town in which to raise kids. Uh, alcohol and such was not going to be in evidence. Basically, Alamogordo was one of the cleanest towns in terms of the morality factor involved with alcohol. Alcohol meant saloons, prostitution, gambling, all those things that came with it. You didn't find those in Alamogordo. So in that sense, you're dealing with sort of a unique situation in that uh, most towns in the West had saloons. I came to Alamogordo in 1956. This is home to me. Um, and one always hesitates to criticize his home, I guess. 
But this town is in many ways an exact reflection of what the founders wanted. It's a family friendly town. In short, if you really back off and say, did the founders do their job well? I think the answer has to be yes. The St. Joseph Apache Mission is located on the Mescalero Apache Reservation in southeastern New Mexico. The original construction of the mission has a history all its own. However, the story of the restoration of the building is about more than rocks and mortar. My name is Tommy Spotted Bird. <clears throat> I'm a Kiowa from uh, Oklahoma originally. I've uh, been living in Mescalero for uh, a little over 17 years now. <clears throat> And the reason I came to Mescalero 17 years ago was uh, I'm a recovering alcoholic and I came to uh, their program that they had here. I finished the program and uh, you know, I went back to Oklahoma. While I was here, I met a lady that I really liked. So I came back and I decided that I needed to find a job. I ended up marrying this lady. I heard about this in the restoration of the church. So I came and I talked to the director. I came to interview. They ended up hiring me. You know, they didn't look at me being a, a recovering alcoholic or anything like that. I knew nothing about the stonemason, about restoration restoration of a stone church. When I came to interview, they had uh, scaffolding all the way to the top of the ceiling. One of the questions they asked me was uh, if I was afraid of heights. I said, no, one of my last jobs was a 36-story building in Kansas City. The good thing about coming to work here was the former brother that, that was working here, I knew him from before because he, he worked with me down at the rehab. He was a counselor down there. I felt like you know I had my personal counselor. I came to work every day and, and the problems that I was going through, if, if I needed to talk to somebody, was he was right there working you know beside me. Today, I can say that I've been sober for 17 years. The church building itself means a lot because I put in a lot of years and a lot of time in this building doing the restoration. I've talked to a lot of people through the years that come in, they see this this building and they're in awe when they come in and look inside and they say, my heart is, is, is here now. I've been working in this building for 17 years now and uh, you know, it's helped me to stay sober. I say this building, but deep inside I know it's God. God's the one that, that brought me here. He brought these people into my life. As I look back in my life, God knew exactly what He was doing with, my, with me in my life so that I can work on this church, so that people for, for years and years from now will have a place to worship Him. That's why he saved me from, from destruction, so that I can save this church from destruction, so that people can worship him and glorify him for years and years to come. That's why I'm still alive. That's why this church means a lot to me. My name is Harry Vazile. Uh, we're here today in Mescalero, New Mexico at uh, St. Joseph's Apache Mission. The history of this church is really part of my experience of life. Uh, I came here 26 years ago as a Franciscan friar with the St. Barbara province out of California. The Franciscans have staffed this church for over 100 years. So in the early 1900s, uh, a priest came from California. His name was Father Al Brown. He was just a young man, newly ordained, but a very adventurous young man. You know, we really feel blessed that, to follow in his tradition. As a Franciscan friar, I was here for a number of years before I left the order and I got married. So I've been married now 21 years to an Apache lady, beautiful Apache woman, Lenore. And uh, we have a 19-year-old son who's half Apache and half crazy as Sicilian. So this is my home. This has been my home for 26 years and I've continued to kind of work with the church through the years. So that Franciscan tradition uh, has carried on 
Father Al Brown, when he came here in the early 1900s, there was a little church down, down here about a couple of hundred yards, and that was his parish church at the time. Uh, he was the first pastor who ever really resided here. In the past, somebody came up from Tularosa. But anyway, Father Al Brown, the story of this church is Father Al Brown had this little bitty stone church down here. And he was an adventurous priest. He got to know the Apache people. The people loved him. He accepted their ways. You know, you can see in this church how we blended the tradition of the Apache people with Catholicism, with Christianity. If you've ever wondered what it would be like to explore the inside of a cave, we have just the experience for you. We had the opportunity to speak with Arnold Duke, owner of Fox Cave, a 1950s roadside attraction that has recently been brought back to life. Hello, my name is Arnold Duke and we're coming to you today in uh, Mesilla, New Mexico. Uh, we're here today to talk about the Fox Cave. Um, the Fox Cave is a wonderful place that everybody should visit. Um, it's a wonderful attraction. It's naturally uh, made by the water cutting through the rocks over millions of years. And the, basically the story is I came here to Las Cruces in 1974 to go to college. On weekends we'd go up to Rio Doso and I discovered the Fox Cave and it was for sale. I never dreamed that I'd be able to afford to buy something like that and I always kind of kept an eye on it. Well in 2010 the opportunity came up because it was for sale in a foreclosure bank auction. The previous owner, Barbara Cody, Buffalo Bill Cody's granddaughter, had owned it and passed away and had gone back to the bank. So I went there with a couple of my kids. We kind of had a limit of what we could spend and uh, we were the successful bidders. Well, soon after we bought it, we discovered what a big job it was. That property had been used as a public dump for about 25 years. The real dump in Rio Doso is very, very close, but you have to pay to dump things there. Well, we discovered there was a large group of people living on the property and about 50 cats. There was cars and boats and tires. It took us about six months just to remove the trash. The price of the property was about the same as the price of the cleanup. But it was a labor of love and we just loved every minute of it. And today it's opened. Uh, we're open every day except Christmas. And it's a wonderful, fun place for everybody to see. Also, it has great history. Both Billy the Kid and Geronimo would hide in that cave. And inside the cave, you can see there's soot on the roofs from all the fires that were there. The Rio Dosa River used to come right in front of that cave, and actually the river is what cut the cave. Back in the 60s, they decided they were gonna move the highway and the river and they were moved away from the cave up until then it was a big tourist attraction but when the highway opened without the road going in front of the cave the business died and uh, we've been open now for about five years uh, we have a gem mine there where you can buy a bucket of dirt for ten dollars and if you don't find at least eight different gemstones you get to go again free and there really is something for everyone so when I came here in 1974, I really had a keen interest on Billy the Kid. And of course, where we're standing today is right across the street from the courthouse where he was sentenced to hang. In 1974, I started collecting documents, photographs, and memorabilia from the Lincoln County War. And today, I'm probably the largest private owner of things from the Lincoln County War. So at Fox Cave, we have Billy the Kid's gun. We have Sheriff Pat Garrett's gold badge, the most expensive badge that ever sold in the world is in our collection. Uh, Pat Garrett was given that badge by Judge Albert Jennings Fountain, who was the big judge who actually lived right behind where we're standing, and today his family still owns this property. We have uh, General Lou Wallace, the governor of New Mexico that promised to pardon Billy the Kid. We have his Civil War sword. Of course, the main focus of our museum is the Lincoln County collection with all the things from the Lincoln County War. But we also have an alien room because as everybody knows, the aliens crashed in Roswell, a short distance from Rio Dosa, and we have actually their movie props from most of your major alien movies from, from the X-Files to Jodie Foster's movie Contact, uh, but we have a wonderful alien room. 
Um, I like dinosaurs and fossils, so we have a lot of fossils. We have fossil dinosaur eggs, and we have big rubber dinosaurs that look real. Uh, we also have a movie star room because my main line of work is I run a company called the International Gem and Jewelry Show, and we have jewelry from all kinds of famous people. We also have uh, fossils, rocks, minerals. We have a large collection of gold nuggets. So it really is a great experience. It's really something for everybody. In 2017, the Otero County Fair and Rodeo celebrated its 78th year. We were on location to experience some of the sights and sounds. We met up with Joan, who shared her talents and experiences with us. Hello, I'm Joan Nussbaum. I'm with the High Canyon Weavers and Spinners Guild. We're here at the Otero County Fair uh, with, as an exhibit on weaving and spinning for all of our friends here in the Southwest. We have a group of ladies and a couple of gentlemen that are weavers in this area. The uh, Cloudcroft, Tularosa, La Luz, uh, Alamogordo area. We all support weaving and spinning, uh, enjoy it as a hobby, some of us professionally, others to teach. And our goal is to introduce to the young people that are showing their livestock here that there are other uses for fiber besides raising animals for meat. We have several people raising herds of alpaca in this area and I would like to see some more young people consider raising the animals so their fibers can be spun. See, I'm kind of selfish. I want to use the fiber. We support each other. We do workshops. We teach new people how to weave. We're kind of a consortium of looms so that people always can buy a loom if they want. So there's a way to uh, find one. We like the antiques. The county fair has invited us to be an exhibitor. This is our third year now and uh, the ladies are really enjoying it. I think we've touched a lot of children during this time and we have found the hidden weavers and the spinners that have been in the woodworks didn't know they had anybody around and kind of brought them into where we can visit with them and support them with learning and advancing our craft. Uh, I have been weaving since 1976. I saw the weavers at the show for the 76th uh, centennial uh, celebration and I wanted to do that. So the first chance I got at the community college I took a course and I've been taking courses since that time and uh, learning different techniques, practicing what I learned, going to workshops, I've traveled around the country going to workshops. I've had a studio to uh, teach weaving in Clint, Texas for a long time. I taught in Houston and uh, now I'm teaching in Cloudcroft area. We teach weaving at the Tunnel Gift Gallery. Well, I have eight looms in there that we teach. Then we have a group of spinners that come on the second Sunday of the month and just sit around spinning. Because usually learning to spin is a showing how it's done and then let him go off and practice and practice and practice. There used to be a Navajo weaving school in La Luz and um, Ms. Herrera died a few years ago and, and there are a few of us still doing Navajo weaving and practice with Navajos and come back and try to do something similar to what they do but we're learning the correct techniques. There's a variety. There's Swedish weaving, there's Navajo weaving, there's Southwest weaving, there's just ever imaginable type of thing you can do. The main thing is that you're making some kind of uh, web, a fiber bit, a rug, a piece of clothing, a wall hanging, placemats, on and on and on it goes. The Guild does have a Facebook site, High Canyon Weavers and Spinners Guild. It's there at the Tunnel Gallery also. And there's about uh, 25 of us I'd say now. If you're looking to learn to weave, do tapestry weaving and you say well I don't want to do a loom weaving we'll give you the instruction to get started. But our goal is to teach as many as we can and to find all of those weavers and spinners that are out here in this part of the Southwest. The Tularosa Basin Museum of History had its opening on January 16, 2016. The museum's location was originally the Plaza Bar and Cafe, which was opened in the late 1930s. 
Hi, I'm Joe Lewandowski with the Tularosa Basin Historical Society. We're currently at the Tularosa Basin Museum of History, located in Alamogordo, New Mexico. The society itself is a historical society, but we have two main complexes, which is the La Luz Pottery, which is another area of our, our where we maintain and take care of and also teach the people about. And then the museum, of course, is our main complex that we do most of our activities at. The historical society itself was actually formed in 1964, but for four years there was never a museum. They were together talking, gathering, figuring out what they needed to do. And by 1968, they were able to come up with enough money to add on to the, the current Chamber of Commerce down here on North White Sands Boulevard. That extension you see on the south side of the building wasn't originally there for all us. The old timers will remember that was just a little tiny Chamber of Commerce. So that was added in 1968 and the first museum actually opened for the Tularosa Basin area. Uh, from there it grew and uh, and more things added, but the museum never did grow. As time went on, the old plaza bar and cafe became available, and the historic site at that time thought this would be a great place for a new home for the museum. And by 2012, we actually acquired grant funding for, uh, from the state of New Mexico to actually restore the building through Otero County, and then we utilized our own funds through donations and other many programs that we had to actually set up the museum inside. And uh, the plaza itself as it goes back about back to 1938 and, and we restored that all through 2015. I spent almost half a million dollars on the place to put it back together and then all with volunteers we built all the exhibits and all the things in the building. And any of you have been to the old museum you saw some of the items but about 80 percent of everything we owned was actually in storage. So you know, everything in here to most people is brand new and there's a lot of interesting stories, a lot of, a lot of things from the old west days all the way up to the Atari games to the atomic age, uh, military, that all kinds of stuff. It's amazing of uh, the history that's here. I grew up here, thought I knew, and but once I got involved with the museum, uh, I realized I knew basically five percent of the history of what I thought I knew. <laughs> Even though most museums in the state are government funded in one form or fashion, we've been able to keep ourselves independent and we'll continue to do so as long as we can and we don't see any problems in the future. Coming to the museum there's many many stories from all the way back to the founding of Almogordo and so on but it's not just Almogordo. A lot of people think it's the Almogordo Museum, it's actually the Tula Rosa Basin a Museum of History. We tell the stories all the way from Carrizozo to Chaparral, from the Oregon Mountains all the way up into the mountain communities. We don't try to overdo certain areas that have museums such as the, the really great uh, museum in Cloudcroft. The Carrizozo Museum has a great one going and so on. Uh, luckily we happen to be on the, the corner of the one of the busiest intersections in Alamogordo which gets a lot of people to come in but it still amazes me at how many people still haven't came in or don't realize it's a museum or don't just don't take two minutes to stop and come in. Now when you take two minutes to stop and come in that's fine but you better give yourself a lot of time because once you get in it's very deceptive from the outside. It's a, a very large building and it's amazing how many people walk in, sign in and decide to go through the museum and think they're going to be in here in 20 minutes and two hours later they're still going through looking at all the exhibits and everything that's in here. Far more than you would ever expect and far more history and things and interesting things. Not the good old dry history of you know, you know, here, here's the pioneers. There's all the histories of as you, the Sierra Theater and the, all these other things that some of us remember in our time. But there's also goes back to you know prior to Almogordo even being here when it was just Tularosa and La Luz. Almogordo is really not that old. Almogordo is only 1898. It goes further back than that. Uh, all the way up to the current, which is, you know, the Atari dig, which is a, a strange story in itself. 2012 was also the year that we acquired the, the La Luz Pottery. A man by the name of Mr. Ray Graham actually donated it to us. The whole, the whole complex was donated to it because he wanted it to be make sure it was taken care of and kept historically correct, not subdivided into a bunch of home lots. And that's what we've been doing and have been improving on. So our whole, our whole uh, job here is to maintain the history, learn the history, and we're learning every day. Uh, you know, it's, it's amazing of uh, the history that's here, 
I grew up here, thought I knew, and but once I got involved with the museum, uh, I realized I knew basically five percent of the history of what I thought I knew. <laughs> so at that point, we uh, you know started setting this up, and more people got more active, and still, and we're still looking for more active. We're always looking for volunteers. We are an all volunteer agency. Uh, everything you see going on here is volunteers. So when you're in Almogordo, make sure you get by to see the Museum of History. We're open six days a week, ten to four every day. For more additional information on us, we do have our website, the Tularosa Basin Historical Society. Just put in Tularosa Basin Historical Society, it'll take you to our webpage. It'll tell you all about what we do, what we have, our research areas that we have. If you're wanting to do research projects and anything else, we, have, we can help you with that too. Thanks for joining us today. Make sure to join us next time as we experience New Mexico.